There was a time, actually it was for most of human history, when pockets of a civilization depended upon the collective strength of a group of men. And every conflict threatened complete collapse of everything you know under the weight of foreign ambition. Welcome to Coffee House. Some 2,500 years ago, a group of men took a stand, and Stephen Pressfield wrote a book about it. This is a book that is now assigned to our military corps. Gates of Fire, an epic novel of the Battle of Thermopylae, is about the 300 Spartans who gave their lives, delaying the Persian horde, and the culture that produced those Spartans. So, as always, we will go through the contents, and then we'll talk about some analysis of the book to discuss kind of the quality of it, and then we'll go into some big picture stuff to put it all into a broader context. So again, as I said, this was a novel, so we're not going to go through beat by beat through all of it because I've only read it once, so I wouldn't be able to recall all that anyway. But we will hit many of the major points. If you want to read it for yourself before we spoil a bunch of it, then you might want to do that and come on back. Otherwise, I will hit the main points here and discuss a little bit, and then we'll go into the analysis. So it opens with Zionies, and I could be mispronouncing these names. I think I'm going to say Zionies, actually. I think I'm going to say Zionies. And this is the protagonist of the book, and what had happened was he was apparently part of the 300 Spartans who had killed 20,000 of Xerxes' soldiers at the Battle of Thermopylae, and he was severely wounded, but taken prisoner. He was the only survivor, and he was taken prisoner by Xerxes. And Xerxes asked him to tell a story, to tell him the story of how those Spartans got there, and his story specifically. So, it being a novel, of course, we start from childhood and go all the way through the battle. But that's the structure, is that it's Zini's telling this story. So we start at the end, and we jump back to the beginning. So through his youth, it begins, I think, him and his cousin are kind of hanging out, and he tells about his home life, and his mother and father, and not to his cousin, he's telling us this stuff, (laughs) telling Xerxes this stuff, and via Xerxes telling us. So he has a, a cousin, he has his family, he has a beloved slave that works in the house, who dominates the house and makes all the decisions, Ruxes, and he's blind. But there are many descriptions of, like, traditional food and what the village would be like. And as far as I can tell, there's a whole bunch of research that went into this and gives wonderful detail. This is actually, I really enjoyed this part of the book, just to the beginning. And as he and his cousin are walking through and we're getting a lot of tidbits about how life would work around this time. And this would have been, what, around 480 BC? So in the midst of this, they're wandering through the village and we're getting all these details about what the village is like, what the people are like, what the food's like, which made me hungry. I am, uh, this stuff sounded good. (laughs) I, I thought I would actually like to partake in a lot of this food. I like Greek food in general, but anyway. So in the midst of this, and as I'm enjoying myself, then the village is attacked. And it felt, that's the weird thing, because this part of it, it felt abrupt that we were enjoying ourselves in this village and then suddenly it was attacked. But it turns out he had a lot to get through, Pressfield did, the author. So I guess it makes sense to have this inciting incident so quickly. But this was not the Persians that did this. These were allies of the Greeks, like other Greek city-states or whatever, who had betrayed So he flees, he and his cousin flee, and she is uh, a would-be love interest as we go along. But So they flee and head back to his home, and they only find Ruxes, the blind slave, and that his parents were dead. And then we deal with some of the aftermath of the attack and how it affects the, the kids. And the trio just end up roaming the country, and they move at night, and they have to steal what they eat, or catch or steal what they eat. At one point, he's Zio, and that's, I think, short for Zionese, <laughs> Zio. He takes to stealing. He ends up stealing from the wrong people at the wrong place and gets effectively crucified. They jam nails to his hands. And so he's up on this thing and in a bad situation, but he's saved by his friends. But his hands are mangled at this point because of this. So he's worried that he would never be able to join, you know, the Spartan military. And this is obviously for Spartans, this is an extremely important aspect of a boy's life. So he's despondent because of this, that he will never be a soldier. And he tries to kill himself by exposure, but his friends save him. Eventually, he splits from the group. His cousin suffers the worst of indignities, and so there's this struggle trying to deal with that for both of them, that he wasn't strong enough to protect her and that she had to suffer this. 
and they end up splitting and he goes with another group and ends up being a part of the i don't know how to pronounce it, a goge a goje <laughs> the goge is the term for the training that youth have to go through the military training that the youth have to go through and it's apparently extremely rigorous it's it's really harsh and in the book it's depicted as i mean i don't know it's like drill sergeants uh, like you see in full metal jacket you know, a lot of cursing a lot of name calling a lot of that kind of thing a lot of physical toll that's taken on people and violence but in the midst of this, he realized that he can use a bow. So he doesn't necessarily have to use a sword to be able to wield it because of his hands, but he can still use a bow. He meets Rooster, who's another character that shows up. There's another one, too. Who was it? Was it Alexander something? But there there was another one, too. But there were, there were several that he meets at this point that I'm just mixing up now. But Rooster's one of them, and there's this whole subplot related to Rooster where there's this intrigue wherein the wife of this prominent Greek pretends, asks Zeo to look after Rooster and pretends that Rooster is the offspring of this prominent Greek guy so that she can save his life. And there, there's a number of scenes related to that but one of his friends was also sent on this assassination mission that fails to go assassinate Xerxes but anyway skipping a lot there are years pass uh, he and his friends get married and have sons and daughters but then the Persian threat increases and we have the build-up the preparation for the battle itself so of course King Leonidas is one of the is the Spartan leader and everybody will have heard of Leonidas it comes from that movie <laughs> that movie directed by Zack Snyder, where none of the men wear shirts and they all have six-pack abs and it's really stylized violence. Uh, you know, to some degree, I have to appreciate the uh, support of testosterone masculinity <laughs> because that's something that is decried nowadays, but still. Maybe it's a lack of those kinds of, that kind of entertainment anymore that is leading to the flood of estrogen amidst our, our male youth now. But anyway, so they're they're trying now to figure out, okay, what are they going to do to try to fend off this Persian attack? This was, I think, the second time, if I remember my Greek history. <laughs> this is the second time, right, that the Persians try to invade. But there's a choke point at this one particular area. So they say, we need to resist them at this choke point. They do the same thing. There's like a strait that they go to in the Navy with their naval forces. They say, okay, we can use these choke points. And whether even if they outnumber us dramatically, then we can hold them here fight them off to some degree and do much better than we would out like in an open field or something so the spartans have to gather more troops from allies around the area and they have to go to this choke point and when we get to the actual battle now the whole structure of the situation here is that they have they need the navy to prevent them from being flanked at this choke point at thermopylae so that's what the Navy's doing. And then this other military force, it's it's apparently and allegedly, of course, historically, there are a bunch of different things going on uh, for what is actually supported by evidence for how much how many people there were and, and how many troops there were and all that sort of thing. So the version of it here is that there are 300 Spartans and they are the primary force. There are a few thousand other troops that are there who are supposed to uh, support this force. But the 300 Spartans are the ones who are fighting this. And in the midst of this battle, you have descriptions, very detailed descriptions of tactics. So like the, the phalanx, how that worked, how effective it was, and, and all these descriptions of the battle and what was happening. And the ultimate result is that the 300 300 of the Spartans who were there, these elite, this elite force, were able to slay some 20,000 of the invading troops. But the point was for them to delay this force as much as possible to give enough time to the rest of the Greek forces to gather more support, to gather more allies, and for the navy to do what they need to do to try to defeat Xerxes' navy, the Persian navy. Now, when it comes to historically, I guess I'll just throw it in here, but apparently, you know, as with anything, it's somewhat exaggerated. The whole point of the story is about the just patriotism that went into this. It's this incredible feat. It's supposed to be this incredible patriotic feat that these this very small number of Spartans were able to withhold for so long. I think it was like three days or something like that and kill so many of the enemy before themselves being killed in total it was it was all of them who were wiped out in this story of course it is zeo who makes it out of there who eventually dies of his wounds 
but there are different estimates about how many were actually there. The the kind of traditional version is that there were 300 Spartans, they're the main force, and there were a million Persian soldiers on the other side. More contemporary estimates have put that at 100 to 150,000 Persians on the other side and several thousand of the Spartans and allies of the Spartans. But as far as I know, the actual choke point soldiers who lost their lives were <laughs> were about 300 Spartans who were doing all this. Who knows if they actually killed 20,000 people? But still, it, it's probably just a pretty incredible feat in general. So as this finishes up, we have Zeo who's telling the story, and as he finishes up the story, the Persians are being engulfed by the Greek forces, and their navy gets defeated. So Xerxes has to change his tactic here. And so Zeo stops getting the medical attention that he was getting from the Persians, who have to turn to their own people, and, and Zeo succumbs to his injuries. But of course, ultimately, the Greeks repel the Persians and are victorious. So that's the story, essentially the story that goes through, but it's like 400 pages. There's a lot going on here and a lot of stuff in the midst of that to try to better demonstrate what Greek culture was about and specifically Spartan culture was about and how it produced the kinds of soldiers that are capable of this kind of a feat. So from there, we will move on to the analysis. So it's historical fiction, of course, and it feels fattened, <laughs> and historical fiction generally does. The thing that goes on in your brain is, okay, what parts are slopped on to what is actual history? A lot of times while I was reading it, I thought to myself, I would kind of just rather know what happened in history, <laughs> like all the particulars of that. When you have this kind of storytelling, when it's historical fiction, when you have that the real character is the history or the real character is the city-state, you know, that's the real character. So when you have that, you often end up with kind of generic characters plugged in. And I wouldn't go as far as to call these characters generic. I don't think it's it's quite to that level, but the characters are really broad. They have these really broad strokes when it comes to defining who they are. They are defined by the loudest aspects you could imagine, <laughs> rather than subtlety or complexity. So the main character, you know, is defined by the broadest strokes of wanting to be part of the Spartan military, of, you know, wanting to date his cousin or whatever, and having his family destroyed, having his hands injured. I mean, all those things are really broad strokes that fit in directly to the general story that's being told. So it's not really a character on its own. It's not a really subtle, complex character that is in the midst of all these things happening. And same thing for his cousin, and same thing for the slave character. I mean, these are defined by the really kind of broader things about the historical context, rather than something internally about them, or something more complex about them. Which is what you would have to do more of if you're trying to tell a story that doesn't have that particular character. It doesn't have the, the city or the history as the character. You would have to do more of defining the complexity of your own characters in that. It would be more required. We don't have so much else going on. So to that extent, it did kind of mean that the characters were too broad and too convenient for, for, for this kind of a story. Now, obviously, the author himself might have had just a particular interest in the culture of it, in getting across the culture of it for purposes of, you know, military appreciation or patriotism or something like that, which is, I mean, it's fine. You can have whatever inclination you want. But still, you end up with these kind of plugged-in characters as opposed to complex characters. So the prose itself is much better than most. <laughs> it was it had some very interesting use of language in trying to go through a lot of these things. There were some turns that I was just like, that's that's actually that's really well done. I appreciate that. But for the subject matter, a lot of times I found myself thinking I would have preferred kind of a Hemingway approach, <laughs> you know, something more Spartan for the Spartan culture rather than being so verbose and uh, I wouldn't say it got flowery, but uh, there's like excessive descriptive language for purposes of what it was describing for the subject matter. There was something just too overwrought about it for the celebration of Spartan culture. So overall, it just felt like too much. But it really does cover much of the what's culturally important about Sparta, and I can definitely see why it's uh, signed to the military. It makes sense. So big picture wise, culture matters. So that's uh, it's a really important thing to understand. Right now, we are going through this weird crisis in our military where we, we have this woke military issue where it's no longer about being the most effective force to make sure that we're safe. We have all these other ideas bleeding in that have nothing to do with that. 
in addition to the fact that I think it was just recently announced that all of the military is going to be required to participate in a particular medical <laughs> action that could be long-term dangerous for our military. We don't know what the long-term effects could be. So, I mean, it's still classified as experimental. So aside from that, though, you know, for ancient Greece, obviously, you always saw the distinction between Athens and Sparta. Athens is the high-minded democracy. Sparta is the militaristic one. And in this context, 300, they're working together. The, the 300 are meant to be an example of great patriotism. But later, Sparta would be the one to defeat Athens in the Peloponnesian War. I think I've got that history correct, right? <laughs> it was later. It was like 50 years after this or something like that. You have this, the Peloponnesian War. And that started just a long-term decline of ancient Greece, the great ancient Greece. So the question is, what is the evolution of city-states? What is the competition? How does it work? Who are the fittest when it comes to the competition of city-states? We haven't seen it on the scale that we have it now, but right now we have Russia and China, and they have their totalitarian regimes, and you wonder if that is going to be the fittest in the context of geopolitical conflicts relative to democracies or republics like ours. I mean, America has a nominal democratic republic because right now we're dealing with the influence of multinational tech monopolies and trillion dollar companies and a complicit news media, an unprecedented power grab by the current establishment and just this, this idea of perpetual emergencies, especially for something that kills fewer than heart disease and Alzheimer's on a regular basis. And it's still being used, used as justification for abrogating our most basic freedoms. And just this constant clamor for more and more power. So you wonder just exactly how much of a republic or how much of a democracy we actually have left. But that being the case, if that weren't the case or that being the case, you still wonder, okay, how is that philosophy going to compete on a geopolitical scale against what's going on in China and Russia? And that was the question, you know, 2,500 years ago when it came to what Athens was doing being the seat of philosophy, something that seeded the rest of Western civilization, you know, from there, and how it failed to be able to compete with somewhere like Sparta, which didn't have that pedigree, but had its own militaristic one. So you definitely wonder, I know we've kind of talked about it before, but you definitely wonder how those things are going to compete. Anyway, so that is Gates of Fire. I'm very glad I read it. I wasn't so sure about plugging this one in before we went to Mark Levin's book, American Marxism, I think it's called. But I think it was totally worth it, and it, it's very applicable to our current situation. So I hope, if you read it, I hope you enjoyed it. If you didn't, I hope you enjoyed listening about it at least. And that was Gates of Fire, Stephen Pressfield. And we will move on from here. Like I said, next one is Mark Levin. It's American Marxism, and I will see you there. All right, bye. Bye. <music>